Hi, I'm Fiona Meldrum from the University of Leeds, and I'd like to welcome Gert Seder. He is um, Chancellor's Professor at the Department of Material Science and Engineering at Berkeley. Good evening. Hi, so, good evening. I'd just like to ask you a few questions. So your research lies in the area of materials discovery. So what inspired you to start working in this area? Well, you know, so materials are so important, right, for society, and I always felt, you know, way back when I was a student, mm -hmm. that uh, materials discovery seemed so... Uh, accidental almost that I, I, I really wanted to contribute to developing better methods to do materials discovery much faster. So that's how I got into that area of you know computationally driven and sort of rational materials design. And what do you think the key challenges in your field are? Um, you know obviously we still have to get better sometimes at predicting certain properties but 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 it's going quite well and I think maybe some of the key challenges that we're looking at is like, we cannot get very good at predicting materials and their properties, but there's this issue of then, you know, how we're gonna make them, you know, making materials is still a bit of a black art, so can we start moving predictive modeling and computation towards, you know, rational design of synthesis methods, deciding what we can make. And so this is where we're starting to think about, we're, sort of, we're building larger teams, we have an EFRC on this with uh, NREL, the, you ever see there to think about, like, you know, can we rationally understand the synthesis of materials? So how much is this, is a, is this a problem? So you predict what composition may be a material you want to make that will give you given yeah. properties, but then you still face the challenge of making it. So even if you can predict what you want to do, how, how easy is it then actually to achieve that? Yeah, it's become a huge problem, right? And it's sort of a problem by our own making. I think that if you look back maybe 10 years ago, uh, the computation, the prediction part wasn't very good, so you didn't face this problem too often. You would maybe make a prediction after a year's work. Now, because we have learned uh, to automate calculations, we've also gotten much better at it, how to predict materials, um, because you know, in the old days we would target one particular property. I think now we understand the materials design mm -hmm. problem better, uh, in the sense that there's a whole lot of properties you need to, in parallel, optimize. And so we can do that nine high throughput and we can sort of come out with like 10 ideas for new materials. And, 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 and that's putting such a burden on actually the pipeline after that, right? You know, you, you go to your experimental colleagues and say, here's my 10 materials, yeah. come up with something. And, 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 and it's not just that they have to do the work, but we don't know enough about like what, what can even be made, right? Can I put atoms uh, together in any possible way? And mm -hmm. I just need to find a good enough colleague to make that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and, and I think sort of, so putting some bounds around that, like, you know, what is makeable is really going to make our, our, our I think, our computationally driven materials design much more, uh, much more reasonable and much more productive, I would say. Okay. And what distinguishes your work from other people working in this field? Oh. What makes you unique? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I think maybe what makes us unique if you think of us as a sort of theory computation group, even though we do some experiment work ourselves, is that I think there's a certain pragmatism. Uh, we try to um, be very aware of uh, the technology field in which we work and the real problems in that work. Uh, I always joke to my students, you know, it's a lot harder to, um, to figure out what to calculate than to actually calculate it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think to do that, really, you really need to embed yourself in the technology field, right? So we work in multiple fields, but a big one for us is uh, energy storage, lithium-ion batteries. And I think to do useful work in property prediction, you really need to sort of talk a lot to the people who make materials, who do the engineering, even all the way to the commercial side of like, what are really the problems that mm -hmm. you want solutions to? And I, and I think sometimes the, the theory or computational community or the science community in general should do that a little more, right? I think we're losing a bit that connection to the... Uh, to the people who actually make stuff and sell it. Um, and, and so we try to do that. Uh, okay. So some of the big advances in science, or actually probably most of them, come by pure chance. And there's somebody not washing their guts where, but <laughs> being intelligent enough actually to spot yeah. this. So to what extent can your approach maybe make up for that, maybe do that intentionally, rather than just waiting for that adventitious dis um, yeah, yeah. discovery? Well, that's the idea, right? And I, and I think we are getting there. I think you, you can see real fruits of this approach, right? Because, I mean, first of all, you're right, right? A lot of things happen by serendipity and, and somebody, like you say, smart enough to notice it, right? That's mm -hmm. always the thing, right? Um, but, you know, 
we cannot scale that, right? Uh, the only way to scale is we're going to what put 20 times more people at work and, and do more uh, of this serendipity. So, so there really is no other way, right? We have to build a sort mm -hmm. of more predictive, rational driven approach. And it is really happening, right? If you actually look today at the track record, uh, there are lots of novel compounds uh, with interesting properties that have truly been predicted, mm -hmm. right? Not just explained later, really been predicted by uh, computation and that people went in the lab and, you know, amazingly worked, right? Uh, I'm still shocked myself on occasion, right, that we predict something. It's like a totally new compound, right, a chemistry that nobody's ever made. And somebody actually makes it in the lab, and you're still surprised, right? Okay. I'm still, like, surprised that, oh, wow, this actually worked. Mm -hmm. But it's happening, right? And, and the other part of it is that, you know, computation keeps on getting better, right? So this approach of computationally predicting things, you know will get more and more power behind it, right? It's already good today, but you, you look at the vector of where it's going, uh, it's clear that part of our materials future has to come from there, right? Mm -hmm. We can't scale people, right? We just, we, we can't hire a hundred times more people, yeah. right? Okay, so I'd also like to ask you a few more kind of just general sure. questions about science. So as a young researcher, your choice of PhD really informs the rest of your career usually, doesn't it? Right. Yeah. So how would you advise a young person you know, to pick oh. that PhD topic, to find something that's then going to lead them onto that stellar career? Well, you know, I think uh, the most important thing, I think, for them is to do something that uh, they are passionate about. Mm -hmm. I think they should um, not pay too much attention to whatever trend is hot, because probably by the time they're going to join that field and make impact in it, yeah, yeah. you know, they're way on the back of the line, right? So I think they should really do something that they are passionate about, that, um, because that's what's going to drive them, right? You know, a PhD mm -hmm. is a pretty serious enterprise. You're going to spend three, four, five, six years on it. Um, you really need something that gives you the momentum. And, and, and if, 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 if you really feel that what you do is important, that it's going to become important in the future if it's not yet, um, I think that's what people should do, right? So some people are driven by you know, impact, right? They want to make uh, a certain application, whether it's biomedical or energy, and that's fine, right? That could be good. Some people are just driven by pure curiosity in a certain area, they want to do physics-y stuff or chemistry stuff, or some people just want to make stuff, right? And I think people should decide for themselves what they really like and, you know, go for a topic in that area and not worry too much if it's carbon nanotubes or topological insulators or some other, you know, buzzword. Uh, because like I said, by the, time, by the time they're there, there's probably some other buzzword, right? Yeah. So looking at your crystal ball then, so what do you think the big topics are going to be in a few years' time? Well, what would you be advising those students well, that will yeah. give you a career? Well, I wish I'd know, right? Because, yeah. <laughs> you know, for most of us, unfortunately, the big topics that we foresee are in our own area, right? So, mm -hmm. um, well, uh, no surprise, I, I do think computationally driven uh, material science will be big and will remain. It's already big, but will get bigger and remain big, right? Uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, people will start to use, I think, um, serious horsepower in terms of characterization. Because that's a field that I'm not in, but that I see mm -hmm. is so powerful, right? Yes. You know, if you look at the last 10 years of development of characterization instrumentation, it's just fabulous, right? Yeah, and, it's, yeah. and it's made real impact on the field, right? Seeing things at enormous resolution, in situ, on the right time scale, uh, is really creating understanding uh, in yeah. the field. And I think that's going to help us understanding this first problem that I mentioned, how are materials made, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're going to, I think we're going to be looking at how, do, how does A and B react and form this crystal structure sometimes and another crystal structure in other times. Mm -hmm. And so I think those are exciting areas on the fundamental side, yeah. I think, of materials, right? Um, I mean, I think on the sort of more applied side, I think you're going to see certain applications in energy remaining hot, right? It's, um, it, it's, it's already a big field, but but the need there, both from society but from industry, right? There's an enormous pull here from industry as well. Uh, whether it's energy storage or solar or uh, a lot of work in catalysis, I think it will remain hot topics, in yeah. my opinion, at least. No, I mean, I agree. The advances in characterization have been quite Fabulous, amazing. Right? And we are just yeah. starting yeah. off, you know, the possibilities of maybe seeing yeah. molecules and how they yeah. interact with each uh, other. Yeah. It's, just it's really unimaginable, I think, if you wind back 20 years ago that where microscopy was really hard and tedious and sometimes yeah. incorrect. And, and now, you know, we constantly look at things on the atomic scale and 
we're seeing a lot more in situ techniques being developed, right? And, mm -hmm. and I think as that is happening, we're learning that things aren't always the way we thought they were, right? When we sort of do something and, and look at it ex situ. So I think there's some, I think you're gonna, there's already fabulous stuff being done, but I think you're gonna see even more, right? Yeah, in that area. absolutely. So thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome, thank you.